you look at birds, they can do these beautiful, complex patterns in the sky. And I take inspiration from these flocks of birds to engineer real-world solutions. And there's many features that I find interesting. So for example, if you keep adding birds to the flock, the flock continues to fly so they can scale to huge numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash to the ground, and so they're robust to individual failure. And together as a swarm, they can do more than the sum of their parts. For example, they're much, much better at avoiding predators. Now, there is no leader in this flock telling every bird what to do. These behaviors emerge from every bird just looking at their local neighborhood and following a simple set of rules. And we see examples of swarming all around us. We see it in ants as they create these trails to your picnic table. We see it in bees as they make decisions for their next nest site. And we are entirely self-organized systems. Now, the challenge in being a swarm engineer is very often you know what swarm behavior you want. Say you want flocking or trail formation or decision making or self-organization. But you don't know how to design the individual agents. What are those rules that give you the desired swarm behavior? And so to do that very often, we take inspiration from nature. Uh, the other strategy that we use is to use uh, automatic exploration using machine learning to be able to design things like neural networks. So either bioinspiration or exploring swarm rules, either by hand, crowdsourcing, or through machine learning to automatically design them. So here's an example of bioinspiration. Here we have a flying robot. This flying robot has a local neighborhood. This flying robot is going to follow a certain number of rules. One is it's attracted to its neighbors. That allows the flock to stay cohesive. It's also repulsed from its neighbors. That avoids all the robots from colliding in a single point. And it tries to align its heading to neighboring robots. And so we also put a fourth point, which is a migration point. And that's just to avoid our flock of flying robots from escaping. And so if you calculate those four forces, add them up, you get a resulting force. And every robot does that. And the result is a flocking-like behavior. So here is work that we did in the Floriano lab over in Switzerland. And I'm behind the camera here. And because we had these, ru these rules from biology, had simulations to show what would happen uh, when we threw these robots in the air and could test them, this is what it looks like. So these robots are fully autonomous. And these are their GPS trajectories. There's 10 of them. It starts quite messy. But over time, these robots converge to a circular topology, which is what we had predicted. This is the flocking pattern of our flying robots. Now, this was fun, but it was really only 10 flying robots. And in my mind, swarms needed to work in much, much larger numbers, but at least more than 10. And so I spent three years at a laboratory at MIT, the laboratory of Singida Batya, learning how nanoparticles could be designed as useful vehicles to deliver drugs directly to a tumor. And what I was fascinated about is these nanoparticles work in the 10 to the power 13. So that was a huge number that got me excited. And on top of that, the laboratory where I work could make particles of different sizes, particles of different shapes. This might be an iron oxide nanoworm, for example. You could change their charge. Some of these nanoparticles were made of materials that were energy receptive. So you could use magnetic fields, or you could use light to activate them. And you could decorate these particles with molecules that allowed them to bind to receptors that were overexpressed on certain cancer cells. Finally, you could load them and release drugs in a more or less controlled fashion. So really, there were many knobs that you could turn on the design of these nanoparticles. And so if you think of swarming, well, the birds I showed you before probably were using their brain to figure out how to flock. The flying robots you just saw were using a program that I implemented to do a flocking behavior. In the case of the nanoparticles, we don't have a brain. We can't program them easily. But what we can do is turn the knob on the design of these particles so that when you inject them in the system, they do hopefully what you want them to do as a collective. And so this is just an example of two knobs that we turned in simulation to, to just explain why this was important. So here we change the size of the particle. That changes how quick they move. Uh, 
and we change the coding of the particle and its affinity, how sticky it is to receptors on cancer cells. And we're looking at these particles leaking out of the vessel, and we want them to go deep into a tumor tissue. And so what we noticed in our simulations is actually a particle that sounded wonderful because it was very good at sticking to cancer cells. Well, it was actually poor when you consider all the particles working together. Why? Because all the particles would leak out, stick to the first layer of cells they encountered, and not go deep into the tumor tissue. So while the individual design made sense, the collective design was not optimal. And we also designed a game to explore more than just one scenario. So this game called NanoDoc allows us to crowdsource the design of these nanoparticles. And so you have on the right different scenarios that we give the crowd, and on the left, an editor that the crowd can use to design nanoparticles. And when they click inject, that goes back to the scientific simulator uh, that we use for our more uh, academic modeling uh, exercises. What we teach them through this game are things like healthy cells and, and cancerous cells. We need those, otherwise the solution to every treatment is to just dump loads of drug. And obviously, we want to be a bit more specific. You can change the dosage, the timings of injection. You can combine nanoparticles. You can change the size, which changes the speed. You can have cells which are overexpressing receptors and nanoparticles that are targeted to those receptors. And you can load them with something and made a smart material where if you activate the nanoparticle, it releases something in its environment. You can also do self-assembly, which allows them to slow down or speed up depending on the resulting side of that assembly. And so if you're a roboticist, you start saying, wait a minute, these nanoparticles actually have the ability to sense their environment. They have the ability to act on their environment by releasing something. That thing that they release could be received by another particle, which is essentially communication. And although I can't turn left and right like the flying robots you saw before, you could have them speed up and slow down, which could give you the building blocks for some of the swarm behaviors we're interested in. So we've used uh, data from the crowd because that was crowdsourced season. We had around 180,000 simulations uh, for our NanoDog game, and we've been using this now as a bootstrap to train a computer so that ultimately we'd like to give it a scenario and through this trained computer output the right vehicle to deliver a drug to a specific type of tumor. And just like with the flying robots, we like to get our hands dirty. And so these are the microfluidic devices that we build in my laboratory. They're little tumors on a chip. On the bottom, you can see the green nanoparticles moving through our tissue-like level. Uh, and the idea is to see where these nanoparticles go under the microscope in a controlled environment so that we have a better understanding of these dynamics in space and in time. And this is now part of the five-year cancer nanotechnology plan in the US, this idea that we need to understand what all those 10 to the power 13 nanoparticles are doing uh, as we engineer these systems. And actually, this dive into the micro-nano world, uh, coming from robotics, made me realize that so many of these systems are self-organized and could benefit from swarm engineering uh, to help us find solutions. So whether it's the ability of cancer cells to exit their primary site and recruit to a metastatic site, whether it's the ability of bacteria to form biofilms and how we can disrupt them, whether it's the ability of the immune system to self-organize to attack uh, intruders, or whether it's the brain and its ability to self-organize uh, to do meaningful computation. And so this here is a little video where in the nano micro world, things work in huge numbers. And I thought, well, what's the equivalent in the robot world? So this is our first step. Here, what you're seeing, do you think they're fluorescent markers? Some, they're robots. Um, so they're a swarm of robots in our laboratory that are coin-sized. We're running them in the dark. These robots can move around uh, left, right, but can also move around randomly, a little bit like diffusion. They can communicate within 10 centimeters, and um, they can light up based on their state. So here what you saw, let's see if I can do that. Our green 
particle robots diffusing through a robotic tissue, binding to these red cancer cell robots, internalizing and turning blue. And this is a case where, again, they're not able to penetrate deep because they bind very strongly, even though there's loads of room between these two cells. And so this was just a first pass as thinking, maybe we can understand dynamics by looking at these robotic systems. And sometimes bioengineers say, why doesn't your robot go there? And I say, why doesn't your particle go there? But this was really a toy scenario, and we also wondered, could we see something at scale proportionally to the nano world if we were to blow it up to a robot table? So if you take a nanoparticle, which is 200 nanometers, and blow it up to a two centimeter sized robot, that's a scaling factor. And this is something that looks proportionally at scale to something you would see in a tiny slice of tissue where you have six cells here and particle robots accumulating. So this is really a thought experiment. And what it's got me thinking is actually, maybe we should think of robotic systems that work in those huge numbers. So if you look at a farm field, there's one kilometer by one kilometer. That's about 100,000 seeds. Well, rather than making a tractor robot that goes and deposits seeds in a sequential way, why don't we make 100,000 safe, biodegradable robot seeds that go and plant themselves? If you're thinking of water monitoring, what if we had those soft, biodegradable water bubbles uh, that could light up in different ways to tell us where a pollutant might be? And whether, what if search and rescue uh, personnel had bags of these robots that could create trails, a little bit like those ants creating trails to your picnic table? And really what this requires is simple algorithms that are actually inspired from the nano micro world because they need to work in huge numbers, they need to be cheap, we don't want to calibrate them. So random motion and simple interactions is the way we need to go. So here what you're seeing is trail formation with our coin-sized robots in the lab. There's about 100 of them there. You may have noticed it was random motion. They're finding the second item, and they find the shortest path. They find things around obstacles. We get so many features for free. And we discovered this algorithm in the nanoparticle simulator. Here, what you have is decision-making, so robots deciding between blue and red. Again, random motion, random exchanges, very simple local interactions. And over time, you see you get convergence of the decision to blue. Blue is the right decision here, so they're doing the right thing, which is good. And these are our latest results, uh, recently published, where we look at shape formation. This is morphogenesis in robot swarms. And it's work with James Sharp's lab at the CRG in Barcelona. And this uses Turing patterns to grow limbs. So they started as a disk. And through a simple chemical exchange between the robots, we generate Turing spots, like the spots that you see on animals in nature. And these spots then grow. Uh, drive the growth of limbs. So robots move from areas with no spot to areas with spots, and we get these limb structures. And what was so exciting about this work, here we have about 350 robots, is these shapes are fully self-organized. We don't tell them what shape to form, we give them the basic rules, and they grow these shapes quite systematically. Because it's self-organized, we can also chop off some of those limbs and they regrow or we can split the swarm and they self-heal and we could start it from a different shape and they would still be able to form these limb structures. So we can really use the principles from some of those, those micro nanosystems that we see in nature and try to implement them on minimal robots but that work in huge numbers. Now that's the angle where things work in huge numbers. It is worth saying that there is room for robots that are much smarter, but maybe work in smaller numbers. So here what you see is the teraflop swarm from our laboratory, uh, along with Matthew Studley and Alan Winfield. And so these robots, their speciality is that they have a GPU on board. And because of that, we can do artificial evolution on the robots to allow them on the fly to figure out how to swarm. The idea being you put them in an environment, you give them a task, and they will be able to, without any external computer, uh, figure out how to complete this swarm task. And it actually works quite randomly. Um, rapidly, I meant. <laughs> it actually works quite rapidly. So we went from the swarms in small numbers 
to the micro nano world that works in huge numbers but simpler robots and bringing those principles back to the robot world. And I feel like we're now at a time where we can make swarm hardware that works in large numbers reliably, that it makes sense to think of how we could deploy these in the real world. And so my new PhD students are currently working on projects that are trying to get these robots outside of the lab. So one of them is about where ro warehouse robots. Um, so they aren't intended to be the Amazon robots. They're really robots that are meant to be self-organized, maybe for smaller spaces, to be able to organize nice space. We have a student working on underwater robots and trying to think of how we could design something like a water bubble uh, to be able to do environmental sensing. We're looking at monitoring. What if you had loads of robots that could go over a bridge, capture all those images uh, that are helpful, and then do some processing to be able to extract the state of that bridge. And we're currently working with a startup that's interested in doing swarm construction. So what if you could have a swarm of robots that build shapes a little bit like those shapes that I had here, but the idea is to navigate a structure depositing bricks as you go as a multi-robot system so that you can scale up and be more efficient. All right, thank you very much.